We often talk, enthusiasts like you and I, about what is the greatest Formula One car of all time. And inevitably, the discussion goes on forever. There's never a conclusion. It's always very subjective. And in my case, I certainly always introduce cars that I think were the most beautiful cars of all time. I always mention the Lotus 33B, 1965. Um, I have a soft spot, I have to say, for BRMs over the years, particularly from the mid-60s, Ferraris from that period too. And I always mention the Williams FW14B as well, partly because it's very close to my heart in terms of my the career I've been very lucky to have had so far in Formula One. Um, we won the World Championship when I was team manager at Williams in 1992, thanks uh, mainly to the work of geniuses like Adrian Newey, Patrick Head, and of course Nigel Mansell. That car was supremely successful, probably the most technically advanced Grand Prix car of all time, and it was beautifully designed and engineered. I was there, I saw it. We went through growing pains in 91 with the passive suspension FW14. But we always knew that in 92 we'd be moving to active ride, which in itself was not innovative, we'd already seen that in Formula 1, but we would have traction control as well. That was the first time that had been used in Formula 1. And with all the other uh, developments, John Barnard had brought in the uh, semi-electronic gearbox, we would have up and down shift paddle changes on the steering wheel. Still a clutch pedal, but the ability <coughs> on the steering wheel for the driver to uh, go into automatic upshift mode without a clutch, that was, um, if necessary. Also, devices and buttons on the steering wheel to enable him to adjust the ride height, front roll stiffness, all sorts of amazing uh, advances, which Nigel particularly maximised. Uh, and I, it always annoys me, actually, when people ride off that championship was a year in which Nigel Mansell had an unbeatable car, because it's one thing to have an unbeatable car, it's quite another to maximise that car in every dimension and get the best from it. But it was just a golden era. If you think about it now, Adrian Newey, currently um, a world leader with Red Bull Racing, Paddy Lowe, technical director at Vodafone McLaren Mercedes, also at Williams at that time, basically in charge of the active ride suspension side, and Patrick Head with all the experience and knowledge and feel that he brought as well. Uh, today we're at a beautiful little airfield, very near Silverstone. Um, I love airfields, I love the whole atmosphere about them. There's always an energy to an airfield that uh, you don't get any other walks of life. And Williams are going to be running again the 92FW14B. It's chassis number six, which actually didn't do any winning. But that's fine because this car has been sitting around virtually untouched for 20 years or so, and it's been perfectly brought up to date. I said brought up to date, it's been perfectly. Uh, brought into a race mode. There's nothing 21st century about it. It's exactly as it would have been in 1992, but it is uh, hand-built, basically, by the mechanics we had in 92. I was at the Williams factory yesterday, and Colin Watts was there, Watty, and Bob Davis, who, who, were, who was the number one mechanic on the spare car, both um, Deckling the car, just it looked beautiful. So this car is going to run, and it's going to be run. This is the most interesting aspect of the day, I think, by Valtteri Bottas, the Williams current Williams third driver, a young Finn of enormous talent, who I don't think has ever driven a car with more than two pedals. He's only ever left foot braked. He's going to be driving the 14B today. Uh, apart from. Uh, several other interesting aspects. He's going to be driving it with a clutch pedal, obviously. He's never also probably been in the driving position that the 14B is going to require as well, and that's um, it's going to be fascinating just to get his input. At the airfield, of course, he's just going to be going up and down, but it's going to be enough to be able to just relive a little bit of 1992. So this is the scene at this little airfield. It's, uh, well, I must say the car almost looks more in prototype form than it did in early, well, early 91. Of course, the 14A and 14A was virtually identical. There's Bob Davis just walking to the front of the car. Virtually identical to the B. Um, but, of course, that was the 
passive suspension car and Adrian and Patrick I think did a superb job in their planning uh, the development of the B with the active ride you can see the um, actuators there at the top of the scuttle in front of the cockpit and already nice to see Williams covering it up as they always do that's the tradition cover up the whole active ride system there uh, and that was the main visual difference if once the body works on just those horns around the top of the front suspension no um, camel sponsorship on it that's because the car is going to be run shortly in France I believe to be driven by Alan Prost and of course in France no tobacco advertising would be allowed it's a slight sort of reminder of 1991 when the car ran the first few races without any advertising on the uh, engine cover then as well just while we put together the finishing touches of the camel sponsorship deal Tim Newton here just setting up some cones Tim of course uh, team manager race team manager now test team manager if there is such a thing these days Tim how you doing mate Not bad. Tim and I go back a long way he helped me in my very brief racing career working for Roger Dowson Racing and we were just talking about poor old Roger who passed away uh, just a couple of months ago great uh, English British club racing uh, protagonist team owner so uh, the big moment's going to be ready when Valtteri Bottas arrives I think and uh, we see him uh, we see the look on his face when he sees the car and he sees the airfield Bob Davis in his usual position at the front of the car there uh, one of the best front jack men I ever knew and of course being a front jack man means standing there when Nigel Mansell's charging towards you at whatever pace with no pit lane speed limit and Bob was the guy that never moved and Nigel's judgment had to say was pretty much perfect for his race career certainly at Williams just chatting to Chris Dietrich there on the MIT side we have a um, 250 kilobyte BCM vehicle control module in the right side part of the car now which is good for about three laps of memory as compared with the uh, two gigabyte uh, memory they have in the current Formula One cars but as we were just saying it did the job in 92 and this had a lot more computer power than Apollo 11 which got Neil Armstrong there and back so horses for courses fond metal wheels haven't seen that name around for a while but that's all the original uh, that's the original wheel and uh, SEP carbon brakes another word we don't hear very often these days SEP no longer in Formula One at the, at the current Formula One world dominated by carbon industry Hitco and Brembo as it was pronounced was a uh, Renault friendly computer company and helped us a lot with the, uh, the IT side of the car and um, of course Canon was a major sponsor of Williams going right back to the Honda days and then continuing with with Renault as well and there we see the VCM on the side of the car just a card that can be pulled in and out about three laps worth of data as I say but boy did it do the job So you're going to go out on Twitter straight away, Valtteri? <laughs> Sorry? You're going to put that out on Twitter? I'm not in Twitter. Ah, good. <laughs> no social media. Really. Yeah, very good. What do you think about this car? Do you remember it? Uh, what does it mean to you, the Nigel Mansell 92? Well, it's world championship car. I've never drove a car like that. So. And uh, I've never driven any, anything older than uh, former Renault 2007. So, uh, will be cool to see how it goes but more than that active ride traction control it's going to be amazing Adrian Newey car yeah going to be something different for sure it's going to be a great experience and, you know, we've done some uh, active suspension straight line testing but I mean it will be completely different and as soon as I will get to drive around some corners with this thing it will be 
<laughs> it would be nice to That's feel how, the, how it is because the car doesn't actually roll it. Just, uh, by the, by the active suspension, so we'll see. And if you want to reduce drag on the straight, you just press a button. Yeah. A bit like DRS, but probably more effective. Yeah. And, and a foot clutch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I had the, that one in the Formula Renault and F3, so it should be no problem. But uh, everything is so tight in there, so actually, uh, we'll see. It was the first cockpit in Formula One in which you couldn't see the driver's arms. It's very enclosed and quite an upright driving position. You've done a seat fitting. What are your thoughts on that driving position? Well, yeah, a bit more upright and it's really narrow, so your hands are kind of like squeezed, squeezed together and steering wheel is more and more forward. There's also uh, less room for your hands to turn, you always touch the legs a little bit. So yeah. So, uh, definitely something different. And, uh, and I think I understand from uh, the mechanics that you've got a Nigel Mansell steering wheel. I mentioned that only because the rim is thicker than the Ricardo Patrese one. He liked quite a thick rim. It's the uh, personal steering wheel that we had on the car then. How, do you th how does that wheel feel to you? Because you're quite used to the modern sort of semi-computers which yeah. pretend to be steering wheels. Yeah. It's a proper wheel for a start. It is something different to know it is. <laughs> We've got only three buttons, so... Simple. But significant buttons. One, I believe, the radio. The other, I think the other two from memory. One is the the uh, low drag and the other is uh, front roll bar stiffness okay. and on the back you have um, up and down shifts for the paddle remember the first time Damon Hill drove with that paddle uh, shift he was going over the curbs at Silverstone and kept changing up or down as oh, really? he hit the curb yeah, oh, yeah. from uh, so from just knocking his hands yeah yeah but Quite small. Yeah, very small. But as I say, quite a thick rim. Is that a thicker rim or about the same that you would normally have? A little bit thicker. A little bit thicker. Something really similar to what we had in Formula Renault, I suppose. Have you, have you ever met Nigel Mansell? Uh, not, not personal. I've seen somewhere in the paddock, but I uh, haven't met personal. He was a... Uh, he was a tough guy, but also very, very technically and uh, uh, technically sound, and, and a sensitive driver too. Yeah. I think yeah. you'd probably get on very well with him. This car was phenomenal in the wet, with the with the with the active ride coming into play, and also Nigel's ability. Uh, in a way, it's a shame it's not raining. I'd love to see you in the wet, even if it's a straight line here. Yeah, <laughs> maybe better at least try first when I get to drive with this car. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we go up the wrong way. The midpoint of the runway, I'll take the off the chair. Yeah. The midpoint of the runway, then we don't turn, back down again. Yeah. And done. And now I'll get you to turn, when you come to the bottom here, I'll get you to turn and turn the engine off there, <laughs> and we'll push you back. Okay. Chassis number six, Johnny, right? It is, yeah, the which, first FW14B. Which isn't a number that jumps out at you in terms of the history books and, and, and results of this car. So, what, what actually did this car achieve? Well, I think quite similar in terms of today's cars it was the first chassis of the year it is the first FW14B so therefore it would have been the high mileage car through the pre-season therefore it went if I'm correct to the early season Grand Prix South Africa Mexico Brazil etc as a T car so it would have seen some mileage in the practice sessions the Sunday morning warm-up but it later became one of the test team's main cars as the because the race cars were chassis numbers such as 10 11 8 in the case of Nigel's early season Season car. Uh, we also it also looks to contain a Prost adaptation for the seat belt, something that would indicate as being a testing car. Because of course, late in the season when he signed for us in September, he was able to commence testing right away. So as well as racing and testing FW15s, he was also testing FW14Bs in the autumn to winter months of 1992. And I see it's in uh, Ricardo Patrese number and yeah. colours as well. Yeah, it's a well, it's chassis six is a car that by my reckoning and my records has been in storage for approximately 19 years and the way that it arrived in storage was in Ricardo's livery for a reason that I, I don't know either way.